So in my opinion, the most important and transformative idea in philosophy is in Plato's Republic, which is a work just as relevant now as it was 2,300 years ago. In this masterpiece, you'll find every possible moral view evaluated, relativism, subjectivism, objectivism, religion, even postmodernism. For many of the new postmodernists and existentialists, skeptics, and nihilists, well, they're simply the old arguments of the sophists. So when you read the debates between Plato and the old Callicles or Thrasymachus, Protagoras, or Gorgias, you'll see these sophists are essentially presenting the same arguments as more modern thinkers like uh, Nietzsche, Foucault, Derrida, Rorty, or Levinas. There is nothing new under the philosophical sun, and everything is in Plato's Republic. So this video has four objectives. The first one is to explain Plato's three-part or tripartite view of the soul. This is a very uh, interesting idea. The second objective is to explain what he meant by justice or morality. And this is a very clever, very subtle and transformative idea. But the most important idea is in the third objective. And that's why you should be just or moral and why the unjust person will never be truly fulfilled or happy. And then the fourth objective is to connect this to other ideas, uh, like the ideas of Jesus. Okay, objective one, there are at least three parts or energies in your soul, in your psyche. These three parts, according to Plato, are reason, spirit, and appetite. As for reason, it's a type of awareness. It's not simply a discursive reason. Now, as for appetite, that's your desire for food, sex, and the fulfillment of other physical desires. And spirit is your emotions, uh, the love for honor, and, ang and there's anger, and so on. But how does Socrates and Plato prove that there is at least these three parts of your soul? Well, great question. Right? The answer is we experience inner conflicts. For example, my appetite tells me to eat that bag of potato chips and to drink a gallon of vodka. But then my reason says and says, no, don't do that because chips and vodka are not good for you in the long run. Now, since there is an inner conflict between desiring chips and not desiring them, Plato infers that there's at least two parts of your soul, reason and appetite. He then does it with spirit, with emotion. So if someone really wants to look at a dead body, but an emotion based on the sense of honor tells him not to look at the dead body. Again, we have this conflict between two inner parts of yourself. And so there must be different parts, different powers of your psyche, of your soul. So Plato continues this type of reasoning with several interesting examples until he identifies the three parts of the soul as reason, appetite, and emotion. Now, this threefold or tripartite division may remind you of other thinkers throughout history, like Sigmund Freud, who divided the psyche into id, ego, and superego. But Freud ranks them in a way that Plato would consider incorrect. Okay, so we just completed objective one. Your psyche has at least the following three components, reason, appetite, and emotion, which he called spirit. And this is somewhat interesting to discuss, but what comes next is truly subtle and transformative. What comes next are objectives two, three, and four. Okay, so objective two is what is justice? Well, this is really cool. Most people think of justice as some action, rule, or law, or they think of it as giving each person what is due, or some kind of value or preference. Philosophers like Callicles, Thrasymachus, Foucault, Nietzsche, they may say that justice is a kind of sham or illusion, is ultimately reducible to power or mere preference. Now, Plato describes these and all other imaginable views of justice or moral goodness uh, in the Republic, and he has much to say of each. Ultimately, Socrates and Plato discover that justice is much deeper than all these views, all these modern and ancient views. And what they discover about justice is something that Jesus and many other religious leaders would approve of. They discover that justice is internal before it unfolds in external ways, and that justice or moral goodness simply is the harmony, the music of the three parts of the soul in which reason, a type of awareness, rules. Again, justice or moral goodness is the harmony of the three parts of the soul. If you fully understand this point, it can transform your life and it has enriched the lives of many people throughout history. So let me give you a couple of examples to help you understand this idea of justice. The chariot analogy is often used to illustrate some of what this view of justice means. Okay, now notice this picture has a charioteer and he has reined in two horses. Now the char charioteer represents reason, while emotion and appetite are the horses that must be reined in. This is something you can easily see by imagining a life in which you let appetite rule you. So, if, for example, imagine that you acted on every desire that popped into your head. You eat potato chips, you drink vodka, you engage in sexual release, you eat more and repeat. 
If you pursued every desire that popped into your head, if you let the horse of appetite run wild, your life would be awful. You would be pulled in too many directions each day. And then you would become addicted, probably, to various lesser goods. As an addict, you would only see your friends as a means or obstacles to get your drug. You would become unable to see and to love. You would experience hell. So it's important to rein in the horse of appetite, to have self-discipline, temperance. And it's not that physical pleasure or appetite is bad. It's just that it's not the highest or the only good. Now, let's take a look at the other horse, emotion. If you let that horse run wild and you acted on every emotion that popped into your head, your life would soon become hellish as well. So instead of understanding and analyzing your emotions, you would become a slave to anger, shame, and other destructive emotions. Again, it's not that emotion is bad, but emotions should play their part and not rule you. So a good, moral, and just life is one in which appetite and emotion do not rule. They are instead understood and steered by a type of rational awareness. In the just or good soul, one develops the virtue of temperance in the appetite, courage in the emotions, and wisdom in the intellect. Okay, so the main point here is just that justice is the harmony of the three parts of the soul in which reason, a type of awareness, rules within you. And by soul, by the way, I mean your psyche. You need not be religious to understand and benefit from this. Now, here's a second way to help you understand the meaning of this type of justice. In addition to the chariot, another analogy is health. So justice is the harmony of the soul. We want to compare it to health. Physical health is a type of harmony, a harmony of the parts of the body. So in a healthy body, the kidney, liver, heart, and other body systems are doing what they do best. And reason is giving them a diet, exercise, and other essentials that they need to create a harmony in the body that we call health. So while justice is the integration of all the powers of the soul, health is the integration and right functioning of all the organs and systems of the body. That is, justice is the music of the soul, and health is the music of the body. So isn't that beautiful? Kind of like a fractal. Justice is the harmony of the soul. Health is the harmony of the body. Political justice is the harmony of the three classes of the state. Each form of justice is the same music. And so music, that beautiful music, that harmony, is what's most fundamental, what is most true, good, and beautiful. And you can also think of cancer. Let's say there's cancer of the liver. The liver grows out of control and tries to rule, and then you have no health. You have dis-ease. You have disharmony, no music in the body. And so uh, it's just a beautiful way to understand the nature of justice in a very, I don't know, clever or subtle way. Okay. And most importantly for this lecture, it, it will transform you as a person if you take this view of justice seriously. Okay, let's move to objective two. Objective one was the three parts of the soul. Objective two is what they meant by justice as the harmony of the soul. And objective three is why should you be just? Now, the reason you should be just is the same reason you want to enjoy beautiful music or be healthy. You enjoy the harmony of the soul for the same reason you enjoy harmonious music or the harmony of the body. That is, justice, music, and health are their own rewards. They're good in themselves. They are what philosophers call intrinsic or fundamental goods. And this point is so important to see. Now, most people, including the modern and ancient antagonist of Plato, they believe that you should be just and moral to avoid punishments like prison or losing social status or hell. Or they believe that just only serves those in power, you know, those cynical views where the, the justice serves the oppressors instead of the oppressed. But Plato disagreed, for when you understand what justice really is, the harmony of the soul, it becomes clear that you should be just and moral for the same reason you want beautiful music. If you experience justice, nirvana, salvation, uh, moksha, satori, uh, grace, mercy, these are a reorderings of the soul. If you experience it, you want it because it is so much better than being ruled by appetite or emotion and the accompanying anxiety, fear, greed, delusion, hatred, and other vices that arise in a disordered soul, a soul that's not aiming first and foremost towards truth, beauty, and goodness. Again, being just like health or music is its own reward, and that's the important point. Now, at the end of the Republic, Plato does give other reasons for being just, moral. He paints the picture of an afterlife and possible reincarnation. But it's important to see that afterlife considerations are secondary reasons to be just, to be moral. 
The primary reason is justice and morality is good in itself. The kingdom of heaven is within, primarily. And so health is good in itself, too, even though we admit that health allows us to engage in other goods. Now, as you dwell on this conception of justice, notice that justice, then, is always good for you, even if it means you'll be locked up or killed. In Plato's terminology from the Republic, it's better to be just and appear unjust than it is to be unjust and appear just. Now, let me give you an example. Let's take an unjust billionaire. Now, I'm not saying all billionaires are unjust, but let's take one, all right? Um, you will not truly benefit if you are a billionaire in satisfying all your desires, all your appetite, if your soul is not in harmony. That is, it's better to be just because you will hear the music of the soul instead of being enslaved by the many vices of a disordered soul. It's better to be just even if others don't see or reward it. Justice is from within and is rewarded from within. The greatest reward is from within. The most miserable person can be the billionaire who appears just but has an unjust soul and so cannot hear the music. Socrates, this incredible saint, has just undermined all cynical views of morality. And now we get to Jesus who said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? There are so many similarities between Socrates and Jesus, and, and differences too, but this is one of the similarities. The idea is you'll never be truly happy or fulfilled if you are not morally good, if you don't have a just soul. And perhaps happiness is the wrong word because both Socrates and Jesus were killed. We have to clarify what we mean by happiness. But I'll just say that there are some things worse than death, worse than being killed. And one of those things is a disordered soul in which you cannot hear the music, the just music that makes life worth living. Being unable to hear that music, to see clearly, and to love is a hell that is worse than being killed. This is something that Socrates and Jesus have in common. So we completed these four objectives, but the fourth objective is also more personal, for I want to show that in a way you already know this. That's something Socrates and Jesus would, would say. You already know this deep down. It's in you, and you can test it. So it's in your video games, fairy tales, literature, and poetry. Many of your favorite stories recognize, for example, the tripart nature of the soul and justice as a type of music or harmony. So Peter Kreeft asks us to consider Lord of the Rings. So in Lord of the Rings, you have Gandalf, Aragorn, and Frodo, right? And they represent reason, emotion, and appetite. Um, or you see it in Star Trek with Spock, Kirk, and McCoy, in Hooper, Quint, and Brody, and Jaws. Right? We could go on. Uh, Hermione, Harry, and Ron and Harry Potter. John, Peter, and James in the Gospels. Ivan, Dmitri, and Alyosha and the Brothers Karamazov. Or in The Wizard of Oz, you have the Scarecrow who needs a brain, the Lion who needs courage, and the Tin Man who needs a heart. So the, the three powers of the Old Testament are the prophets, kings, and priests. So these stories touch on archetypes, on deep patterns in reality that we've been talking about in the early parts of this video. They touch on the hidden music of Pythagoras. Now I'm telling you this factually in a lecture, but the truly great masters like Socrates, Plato, and Jesus, they asked questions. They told uh, parables and paradoxes. Um, they told stories and dialogue forms so you could experience these truths instead of merely thinking about them. Socrates and Jesus especially knew how to awaken the truth within instead of merely lecturing or discussing as I am. Okay, but in regards to the fourth objective, how do you test all of this? We've learned that justice is the harmony of the soul and we should be just because this musical harmony is its own reward, but how can you test it? And I'll just say that all the best in the religious and wisdom traditions give you ways to test it. So test it for yourself. You sit in silence, resist temptation for a week, Journal about your emotions, so you better understand them. You're not controlled by them. They give you some separation from them. And make time for prayer or meditation. Uh, you can fast in secret to control the appetite. You be good and excellent without thought of reward or punishment, just as you may listen to music for its own beauty, for its own sake. Or your traditions might teach you to silently wish others well. So bring some order to your soul instead of letting appetite and emotion rule it. For, for they are goods, but not the highest good, not the summum bonum. And when you do this, a transformation arises within you. You hear the music of justice. It begins, and it has its own rewards. All the cynical theories of justice and morality, from the sophists through Nietzsche and the postmodernists, they all dissolve before you when you do this. 
Now notice this too. You may occasionally have had the experience of being in the presence of a good, loving person. And when you are, for that moment, your fears, anxieties, hatreds, and other vices just drop away while in their presence. So isn't it incredible how encountering a good person can immediately rearrange your soul in a just way? Encountering a person, not simply an idea, is powerful music and medicine, and the best in the religious and wisdom traditions recognize that. It's as if the musical vibrations emanating from this person touch and go through you and reorder your soul in the same way for a moment. And again, all of these traditions recognize the importance of relationships, not just thinking. Finally, when you hear the music of justice, it's the only thing that really matters, and so you can bear all external deprivations, all the cruelties of anybody who is cruel to you, around you. You can even bear unjust persecution and death, because only the music matters. And there's another little thing to talk about here, which is very interesting. There seems to be a secret here about the unity of truth, goodness, and beauty. For justice is a harmony. Justice is a beauty. Justice, that is goodness and beauty, are one, and so is truth. For when you have a just soul, you will see truth more clearly. Both Socrates and Jesus recognize this. Okay, let's summarize all of this. There are many superficial understandings of morality and justice that won't lead to the best life possible for you. Deeply understanding the Socratic view is a corrective, and it's in harmony with the deepest and best teachings of the religions and world uh, wisdom traditions. The bottom line is justice is the harmony or music of your soul, and just actions flow from that. And while you might like the rewards of justice, the primary motivation to be just is to hear that music of the soul, which is good in itself. That is what I think is the most important, the deepest, most enriching idea I have ever encountered in the study of philosophy. Thank you.